do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. That's the opening sentence, opening sentence of our passage today. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust God. Trust in God and trust in me also, Jesus said. You know, as I reflected upon those words, it hit me that most of the time, most of the time we're hearing things, we're seeing things, we're experiencing things which are troubling. Now, typical morning's headlines might read, Bomb blast kills 30 in Kabul. War rages in Syria, Hezbollah declares victory, stock market crumbles. And on the local front, asylum seeker tragedy. But somebody said to me only a little while ago, Murray, we're all only a doctor's visit away from cancer. I thought, he's right. That's what happens, isn't it? You have a pain, you have something, you go to the doctor and suddenly your whole world gets turned upside down. And that's the whole thing, isn't it? That troubles on a global scale can be worrying. They can be troubling. But worries on a personal scale, like when it comes down to you and your family, they can be very, very, very troubling. And as I look around the room this morning, Many of you know exactly what I'm speaking about. And life for you at the moment may be very troubling indeed. Well, I believe that Jesus' word to us today will bring hope and encouragement and victory in the midst of our trouble. So let's open our Bibles to John 14. John 14 verse 1. Jesus said, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Jesus said, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. You know, it seems to me they had every reason to be troubled. I want you to notice where these words that we've just read lie in John's Gospel and where they were when they were said. Jesus and his disciples are in the upper room. They're sharing their their very last meal together. Jesus has just rolled up his sleeves, bent down and washed his disciples' feet. The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, down on hands and knees, mucking, uh, just getting the muck and grime off his disciples' feet. He then predicts that one of his close friends, in fact, one of his disciples, one of those in the room with him that night, will betray him. He even points out to John in private who it will be. And he hands Judas, the betrayer, a piece of bread and says, what you're about to do, do quickly. And after Judas made his way out into the night to betray the Son of God, Jesus turned to his disciples and he said, My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. Just for a moment, try to put yourself in that scene. Imagine what it was like for these men hearing those words. These guys had left everything to follow Jesus. They'd literally walked away from their families, their jobs. They'd left everything to follow Jesus. Their very lives were at risk. And now they were going to... Now he was saying, I am going to leave you. And I'm going to go someplace where you can't follow. And Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? 
I will lay down my life for you. Then Jesus answered, will you really lay down your life for me? I tell you the truth. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Just imagine how Peter felt in that moment. Imagine how the others must have felt. Surely if Peter, Peter of all people, was going to deny Jesus, surely that means some, some great trial stood before them. Something that would test each of them, something that would stretch each of them to the absolute limit. These guys, these guys in that moment would have been under enormous stress, I think. Do you know what that feels like? Do you know what that's like when it seems like your whole world is coming down around you and suddenly everything seems to be going pear-shaped and you can't make head nor tail of anything? I reckon that's what these guys must have felt like. Confused, anxious, scared. Thing is, Jesus knew that within just a few hours, things were going to get a whole heap worse. Very shortly, things were going to really get hard. And in the midst of this, Jesus says, Do not let your hearts be troubled, trust in God. And trust me. Put your faith in me. Thing is, it's one thing, isn't it, to put your faith in the, in the God of old, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and Moses who did tremendous things, but to put your faith in the flesh and blood standing before you, the one who was being betrayed as you finished your meal, the one who was apparently about to be denied by the chief disciple, the one who was about to be abandoned by all and then crucified by his enemies, if you think about it, if you think it through, this was a hard call that Jesus made to trust in God and to trust him and to not be troubled. It was a big call and yet that is the call that Jesus makes to you and I today in the midst of our troubles. No matter how bleak things seem, Trust in me. And that's what Jesus says to you and me today, just as he said to that little group of men the night before he was betrayed. The, sorry, the night before he was put to death. You know what Jesus did next? I guess because he knew how much they needed it. He gave his friends a, a quick little glimpse of heaven. Probably to encourage them as if to say, hey, keep this image before you. Keep this before you. It will give you strength. He said, in my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me. That you also may be where I am. You know the place where I am going. In my father's house are many rooms. There's plenty of room. There's plenty of room for everyone, and not just to stay the night. Now, the Greek word that John uses here implies a permanent dwelling. Jesus is talking about the ultimate home of those who love him. And we don't know very much about what that home will be like. The problem is that the image that Hollywood has painted for us is terribly boring. Isn't it? It's always white clouds, not a lot of colour. But I always look at that and think, hang on a minute. The God who created all this, the God who continually, since the dawn of time, has never stopped painting sunsets and sunrises. Ever thought of that? It never stops. The sun is always setting, the sun is always rising. That beauty is just going on and on and on. The God who created coral reefs and clownfish and lions and giraffes and all of the wonders of kakadu. And, I, mean, I just don't think that whatever God has for us in the future, I just don't think it's going to be all white. And the other thing to remember is that in the end, we don't just go to be with God. God comes to be with us. To live in his world with us, the new heaven and the new earth. 
the home of righteousness. That's what the scripture teaches. The home of righteousness where the knowledge of God covers the earth as the oceans. And of course the most important thing is that we will be with the Lord. That's what Jesus is getting at. Times are tough. Guys, they're going to get tougher. But I'm about to do something literally in the next hours. I'm going to do something that will open the way back to God. I'm going to prepare a place for each of you and everything is going to be okay. He then said, you know the way to the place where I'm going. And Thomas said, Lord, we don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. And from now on, you do know him and have seen him. What an extraordinary statement. Can you understand Thomas's confusion? I can. I love this guy's honesty. He just wears his heart out there on his sleeve, doesn't he? Hadn't Jesus just said, where I'm going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later? I mean, how can he know the way? He doesn't even understand where Jesus is going. How can he possibly know how to get there? I can understand Thomas's confusion. But then Jesus brings his clarity beautifully. He says, Thomas, you do know the way. It's me. I am the way. If you know me, that's all you need to know. You know the way. Just know me, Thomas. Trust in me. That's all you need to worry about. Now, when we think about that expression, the way, it's normally something along the lines of, do you know the way from here to, say, the beach? You say, yeah, I know the way from here to the beach. Well, Jesus is talking about the way between us and God. Not not from where we are now to where God is, because that's ridiculous. God is everywhere. God is everywhere. He fills his universe like we fill our body. So it's not about a geographic location. It's how do we get from where we are to God. You see, the Bible says our sins have separated us. They've actually separated us from God, from our Heavenly Father. When we put our trust in Jesus, when we earnestly say, Lord, I can't do it. I can't fix up the mess I've made of my life. I can't fix up all the times that I've sinned against you. But I believe that your death on the cross can fix it all up if I just trust in you for my salvation. You see, Jesus is the way between us and God because he breaks down the separation. He bridges the gap between us and God. And that is the wonderful truth of the gospel, the good news about Jesus, that he is the way, he is the only way. And that's why Jesus said, I am the truth, because he can be utterly depended upon to provide a way back to God. Many today will tell you that there's no absolute truth. That what is true for one person is not necessarily true for another person. And they'll happily say, yeah, no, but that's great. That's true for you. And it is true. It's true for you, but it's not true for me. I just do not agree with that. There is absolute truth. There is absolute reality. There has to be. And it's found in Jesus. You see, ultimately, it doesn't matter what you or I believe about reality. That will not change the true state of things. It's a little bit like the guy who's falling off a very, very high building. He falls off the top of the building. And on his way down, he's calling out to people, standing out on balconies, watching him, saying, I'm fine. Everything's okay. I'm feeling tremendous. I'm flying. It would actually be, I'm flying. You see, it doesn't matter what that guy says. 
It doesn't matter that he says, oh, what's true for you isn't true for me. Because the absolute reality is, the truth is, regardless of what he says, he's hurtling toward the ground and he will die. That's the truth of the situation. And it doesn't matter what he says about it. There is absolute truth. The truth is that there is only one way to God, Jesus. I mean, it's quite beyond me as to how people can believe that access to the living God, the creator of the universe, would be anything other than exclusive. If you think about it, how could it be any other way? And people get so offended. Like imagine many people would hear what I've just said and say, I'm just so offended that you would say your way is the only way to God. It's not my way. I didn't make this up. Jesus said it. Jesus said, I am the way. I'm the only way. And he then backed up his words by the things he did, mainly that he rose from the dead. How could it be any other way? And finally, Jesus said, I am the life. And as we've seen repeatedly throughout John's gospel, he is the very author of life itself, the source of life for every believer. You know, I think Jesus is wanting to encourage his disciples as they entered a really scary time, a time when all would desert him because they simply feared for their very lives. And I think Jesus wanted to show them that mere physical existence matters little, that the only life worth worrying about ultimately is the life which Jesus brings because he himself is life. And finally, I just want to point you to the wonderful example of faith which Jesus gives us in this moment, right here in this moment. When Jesus said these words to his disciples, he is living out the faith he calls us to have. Have a look at what the writer of the book of Hebrews tells us. He says, now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Remember, Jesus is as completely human as you or I. He's fully divine. But in putting on his humanity, he sets aside all his rights as God. He lives by the power of the Holy Spirit. He runs the universe to this day by the power of the Holy Spirit. He is still fully man at the Father's side. Jesus, in this moment, gives us a wonderful example of faith. It's just amazing. He is exercising the same faith in his heavenly Father that he calls us to do. He's hours away from his prayer in the garden where he begs the Father to find another way. And as he's facing the reality of his impending crucifixion and death, he is so stressed, he is so anxious about what is about to happen. Remember, he's just said a couple of hours before, do not be, do not be stressed, do not be anxious. But he, within hours, is so anxious. His heart is so troubled that he is sweating blood. But in this moment, he confidently says to his followers, I am the way, knowing that very soon he would hang helplessly on a cross. But he says, I am the way. But in a very short time, he's going to be hanging on a cross. He says, I am the truth, knowing that within a few hours, there would be heaps of lies told about him and there would, there would be this apparent spectacular triumph over him that the prince of lies, the father of lies, would have victory over him because the lies would be believed and he would be put to death. And he said, I am the life. Knowing that within hours, his lifeless corpse would be taken down from a cross 
wrapped up and placed in a tomb. It's extraordinary faith, isn't it? That he models for us. You know, there are going to be lots of times for us when the way ahead will seem just as hopeless as it did for Jesus and his small band of followers that night. Eventually, they learned to trust him, despite their circumstances. We need to do the same thing. They didn't learn the lesson that night. I want you to notice that. They did not learn the lesson that night. That night, the night Jesus was betrayed and arrested, they didn't trust in him, even though he just said, trust in me. They all bolted. They all disappeared. They all pretty much deserted him. But eventually, eventually they learned to trust in him despite the bleakness, despite the apparent hopelessness of their circumstances. Every day, regardless of the trials we face, regardless of the nature of our circumstances, We need to step out in faith, putting our trust in the one who is the way, the truth and the life, knowing that even if death takes this body, which it will for every single person here, ultimately we are safe in him. Could I ask the band to come up and get ready to pray, pray, play, sorry, play. You know, many, la- many years later, after this, the Apostle Paul wrote these words to the Corinthian Christians. He said, The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, so it's this very night, the very night we've been, we've been talking about, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, And when he'd given thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We're going to share communion Together, when we do this, when we share this, this simple meal, the, the breaking of a loaf of bread, the sharing of a cup of wine, let us remember the very things Jesus taught his disciples on this very night. In the midst of this, in the midst of the irony of this, in the midst of this is my body broken, my blood shed for you, Jesus actually says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Today, as we share these elements together, as the Lord commanded us to do, let us lay down our anxieties before him. Let us pray this prayer. I will not let my heart be troubled. I will not be anxious and overcome with fear. For you are the way, the truth, and the life. My beloved Lord and King. To those serving, could you come forward and and begin distributing the elements? We're going to start singing, lead me to the cross as, as they do that.